There have been substantial research and development efforts in the past decades focused on hard rock drilling and fracturing, mostly in pursuit of engineered geothermal systems, or EGS. Basement rock is rumored to be the geothermal holy grail because it exists everywhere in the world, at varying depths, and tends to be hotter than shallower, softer rock types. But there is a growing chorus within the oil and gas industry excited by the potential of significant geothermal development in hot, dry, sedimentary basins, where the rock is shallower, softer, and easier to drill than basement rock, and where learnings and technology development associated with the shale boom can be immediately transferred to optimize systems. So where in the world is hot, sedimentary rock, and how much geothermal development potential does it hold? Which geothermal concepts present the most opportunity in sedimentary rock? Let's explore. Hello, welcome. I'm Susan Nash and glad to be here with AAPG. I'm Director of Innovation, Emerging Science and Technology and I'm just thrilled to be here in Pivot 2021. And we are here talking about low hanging fruit in geothermal and sedimentary basins. We have a wonderful panel. So I'd like for each of our panelists to take a moment to introduce himself or herself, but I'm going to go around first and just say each person's name. We have Cindy Taff of Sage Geosystems, of Jeff Nunn of Chevron, John Holbrook, of Texas Christian University, TCU, and we have Mukul Sharma of University of Texas, UT. Welcome. So I'd like to start with you, Cindy, and have you say a few uh, words about your involvement in geothermal. Oh uh, yeah, thank you, Susan. Again, my name is Cindy Taff. I am the uh, COO for Sage Geosystems, which is a startup geothermal company. We were founded about a year ago, and our current focus is geothermal in lower temperature ranges, so 100 to 250 C, which equates to sedimentary rock, which uh, makes this very interesting uh, for us to talk about. Uh, my background is over 35 years in the oil and gas industry, mainly in well construction, with my last role being the vice president of Shell's Global Unconventional Operations. So I'm excited to be here and uh, yeah, I want to thank Jamie for what a great conference so far, but thank you, Susan. Thanks, we'll go counterclockwise. So Jeff, you're next. Uh, yes, so uh, I'm also very pleased uh, to be here. So I'm currently a uh, principal technical geophysicist at the Chevron um, Technology Center in Houston. Uh, so I. Uh, primarily work in currently in the thermal regime, although previously I did some more related work in induced seismicity. And prior to Chevron, I was a faculty member at Louisiana State University and I had grant funding to look at uh, geothermal geopressure as well as uh, salt structures and the Haynesville as possible geothermal uh, prospects in Louisiana. Uh, and, uh, my, I have 40 years experience in geophysics on a variety of subjects. Wonderful, thank you. Mukul, you're next. Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, so um, I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm also associated with a, a startup called Geothermics. Um, it was started about a year, year and a half ago. Um, my involvement with geothermal really began when I first joined UT about 36 years ago. Um, when there was a big project on geothermal at the university, um, looking at uh, wells of opportunity back then with DOE, um, which uh, went away after about uh, eight or 10 years. My interest in geothermal um, uh, was revived about two years ago uh, because I worked uh, primarily in hydraulic fracturing and uh, uh, the application of hydraulic fracturing to uh, unconventionals and realizing that a lot of those technologies may be applicable to geothermal as well, EGS type systems. Um, and uh, in the last couple of years, uh, my, primary, uh, my primary involvement has been using EGS or uh, other systems uh, to generate uh, power from low temperature, relatively low temperature, 100 to 175 C type reservoirs. 
Wonderful, thank you. And John? Yes, uh, one, yeah, once again, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, yes, my name is John Holbrook. As uh, Susan said, I'm a professor at Texas Christian University. So I've been there. I was with the UT system at UT Arlington for a while before that. Uh, I am, uh, my interest in geothermal has been for about the last decade, I, sh I should say. So I guess I'm one of the newer comers to this. But my primary intro into geothermal is I led, a nation, led the National Science Foundation Research Coordination Network into geothermal and sedimentary basins. So uh, essentially my job was to lead a group of scientists from and engineers and business people and social scientists and economists and all kinds of people. There were about 300 or so of us from all over the world who were literally getting together and having this discussion of how to turn sedimentary basins into geothermal prospects. So I'm coming very much from sort of a collective information end. Uh, I have my own part in this broader research area. Personally, I'm, I, I work on sedimentary architecture and, uh, and filling of sedimentary basins. So I very much am uh, personally, most of my research is geared into the plumbing end of this and how water moves in the subsurface and why the pipes are laid the way they do and fundamental things like sequence stratigraphy and so forth. But I bring the perspective of a very larger group of engineers and so forth. And I'm, so I'm, I'm basically parroting most of them today along with my own opinions. And that's great. So as we get started, I just want to take a moment to thank Jamie again for uh, organizing this wonderful experience for all of us. And, and we really appreciate the opportunity and want to also mention that the way that we'll work the session is we will have a few basic foundational questions that each, each of our panelists will answer. And then we will <laughs> we'll take on the, the audience questions. So Jamie has let us know that we should be prepared. <laughs> So looking forward to that, that this first part will take about 20 minutes. So just to give a foundation, um, I'd like to start with Cindy. Um, as a startup, how do you identify low hanging fruit? What does low hanging fruit in geothermal mean to you? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Now, we feel like sedimentary rock is low hanging fruit. Um, the geothermal potential is well known, it's been studied. No one's questioning whether it's there or whether the heat can be harvested. It's whether we can do it economically. And so what excites me about sedimentary is um, as a driller um, in my past life, it's easier, it's a softer rock. So it's easier, cheaper, faster to drill. Um, our off the shelf drilling equipment from the oil and gas industry um, can be used. The techniques can be used. The only difference is you may need a bit, a little bit larger hole, um, which um, equates to drilling with bigger rigs and bigger BOPs. Um, but also horizontal well drilling and hydraulic fracturing are well known in sedimentary rock. So it really presents a huge opportunity to use the skills of the oil and gas industry to go into sedimentary and really optimize the well um, as far as bringing the well cost down, which could then make uh, geothermal and sedimentary rock uh, very economic. Thank you, that's great. So Jeff, I'm not going to ask you exactly the question, the same question, I'm just going to, to say, from a point of, the point of view of a, a super major operator, how is it that you go in and um, like look at basins? which sedimentary basins are interesting? All right, well, from our perspective, and so I think low hanging fruit, you have to define what fruit you're looking for. So as Cindy pointed out, her interest in the startup is sort of in the 100 to 200 degree range. And we would be primarily interested in something hotter than that because as a, as a large company, we would be looking at, okay, something where we could build, provide energy to generate a significant amount of electricity. I mean, I think the, the key here with geothermal is if you drill deep enough, you can get the energy. And so it's what is the market at the surface um, in any particular area that becomes important. You know, so are you using it to uh, generate large amounts of electricity? Are you looking at a, a smaller electrical generation that is going to provide energy to 
a population that's far away from normal sources? Are you going to use it to heat greenhouses or something like that? And so each area is different based on the market as well as on the geology. Oh, thank you. So Mukul, a slight variation. So in your research on uh, sedimentary basins and geothermal, um, from your perspective, what does it mean to have like geopressure variations and how do you deal with that in terms of low hanging fruit in geothermal? Well, thank you, Susan. Um, so, you know, the, the reason that I think that um, sedimentary rocks could be considered low, lower hanging fruit, I wouldn't say low hanging, but lower hanging fruit, because uh, geothermal is complicated no matter how you slice it. Uh, I really, I, I would break that up into, into five parts, into five different ways in which I think sedimentary rocks are actually lower hanging fruit. One, I think we, uh, you know, uh, rocks like granites are essentially impermeable. And so you rely on conduction primarily for heat transfer. And when you rely on conduction, conduction is a slow process. And so you are essentially, uh, um, you, the, the heat flux that you get uh, at the fracture surface or at the wellbore surface is going to be limited by conduction. And in sedimentary rocks, you have both conduction and convection working for you. And that's a plus and a minus, right? So, but, but the heat fluxes can be quite a bit higher. Um, the second um, advantage I, I see is uh, what uh, I think Cindy mentioned, which is it's easier to drill. We know how to frack and drill in these sedimentary rocks as opposed to granites. Um, they're better explored. So, so I think that's an important consideration as well. So we know what, what we have because there's so much data that's available from existing oil and gas facilities. And uh, I would say that number four would be, you actually have uh, well bores that you may be able to use. And that's a question that may come up later as to how, how we can use them and what are the difficulties involved in, in using them. And there are a lot of difficulties involving in using existing well bores. Um, uh, and then the fourth and the fifth points that I want to make is you can actually, in some cases, produce hot brine without having to circulate brine in, in geopressured formations. Susan, you asked about geopressure. One of the big advantages of geopressure, of course, is that the brine does flow into the wellbore quite naturally. And, and, and that's something that saves on the, the, the drilling costs and the completion costs significantly. Uh, and finally, you have co-produced hydrocarbons that you might use to heat up the fluids as well should that need arise. In other words, if your fluids are at lower temperatures, uh, you can certainly heat up these fluids with co-produced hydrocarbons. So I think with those, those five reasons make sedimentary rocks, uh, I think uh, lower hanging fruit than, than perhaps some of the other things we've been doing. Well, great. So John, with your experience with said heat with the NSF program, um, yes. now that once you identify that lower hanging fruit, what exactly do you do with it? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, right now, the uh, geothermal hasn't uh, enjoyed the place in the energy portfolio that we all kind of think it should. Uh, we know that it's, we know that there's a lot of energy down there, as Cindy pointed out. I think uh, estimates of resources are on the scale of 100,000 exajoules in the sedimentary basin. So for about 100 exajoules a year for the entire energy usage, that'd be about 1,000 years. So there is energy and it's meaningful. It's about harvesting it. So the uh, so we have low enthalpy systems. You have lower temperature type systems in sedimentary basins because most basins, sedimentary basins, simply don't get deep enough to tap the deeper tap the really deep or really high heats. And also the geothermal gradients in a lot of sedimentary basins are lower. So there's a reason why that you haven't seen as much wholesale just run out, go for the high heat and sedimentary basins as we might've hoped for in the past. But uh, I think the attractiveness of this is, is that as uh, Nicole said, is, is that we know a lot about sedimentary basins. 
I mean, people like me and my colleagues and all the other people in the room and on the panel have been studying these things for a long time. So we know a lot about the porosity distribution and how water moves to the subsurface because we've been very interested in injection wells and extraction wells and we're bringing a lot of pre-existing experience to the table. So one of the biggest things I think that's exciting about this is with the new advances in fracking, and the new advances in uh, various turbine uh, and turbine and Rankin cycle engines and so forth that have come into play least recently, these lower heat sources, the ability to extract the energy out of them is something we haven't really, really seen until the last few years. So I think I see a lot of potential for renewed interest in this topic. Well, that's great. Um so I'm going to go ahead and start tackling the questions. <laughs> they are flowing in. So the first question is one I think that Cindy could probably answer, but if, if not, I think, I think Jeff could. Um, which entities on the panel are considering oil and gas reuse in sedimentary basins? Any data or demonstrations that can be shared? And I'm going to type this into the Yes, Susan, ab absolutely. We have actually a test well in Starr County, um, which was a exploration, gas exploration well drilled in 2008, that we plan on testing se several of our technologies. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, as far as reusing existing wells, we think hole size is going to be critical because geothermal is very dependent on mass flow rate. And many, at least onshore oil and gas wells are, are a bit too small. Offshore, not the case. Um, so we do think oil fields will be usable, but maybe in a different manner. Uh, we could use the wells for disposal. We also could use existing infrastructure for moving that water around. Um, but when we, when we drill new producers, the other thing the benefit of existing wells gives us is a clear view typically on the geology. So we will typically use an existing well, see what the geology or what the logs look like and twin that well. And so that's the other thing that excites me about uh, uh, sedimentary rock. There's so many wells drilled in uh, sedimentary rock from the oil and gas business that uh, we don't have to guess at where um, the formations are and what they look like. We can literally go to existing wells and um, use, use the data there, realizing it's not always exact when you move away from it, but it, it actually gives you a really good picture of the field. Oh, that's perfect. So um, Jeff, the next question looks like it's going to work for you. Are new technologies needed when transferring stimulation techniques from oil and gas into geothermal in sedimentary basins or are current technologies sufficient? Um, I think we have learned a lot about, um, from especially unconventionals about, you know, how to drill horizontal wells, how to hydrofract them. It is very important in geothermal, um, to not have preferential pathways because again, the whole idea is that you want the fluid to f flow uniformly through the rock to mine as much heat as possible. So I suspect as going forward that there, just like there were in the early days of hydrofracking, that there's gonna be a lot of ex, ex, experiments, um, field experiments, as well as numerical simulations in terms of, of how to do that better so that you don't have uh, all of the fluid going through one huge fracture or some natural fracture rather than going through a large volume of rock. So basically you're talking about new technologies in hydraulic fracturing. Yeah. So, you know, how, how you can do that um, and not uh, limit how much heat you mine. So yeah, I, th I, I think that's an area where we will, just like anything else, we'll have to learn by experience. That's great and a little scary. <laughs> anyway. Um, so Dr. Sharma just mentioned co-production and in that type of concept, which is the primary source of revenue, gas or geothermally produced electricity? And are there technical challenges associated with co-production that are not present in geothermal projects alone? Would you like for me to 
pick that up, Susan? Or? Well, yes, since it was addressed directly to you. Okay. Right. Uh, no, I, I think um, <laughs> co-production has uh, uh, additional challenges for sure. Um, separating the gas and dealing with, in many cases, the gas also has some associated CO2 and so forth. Um, and the, of course it does, as if you utilize the natural gas for um, increasing the temperature of the brine, then you do have a carbon footprint that is can be substantial. So that's 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 uh, definitely a, a challenge. The question then becomes, what do you do with the, with the flue gases once you once you burn the hydrocarbons and so forth, right? Um, the second big challenge, of course, is if if the gas itself has a CO two or other other components in it, you need to set up a separate facility for dealing with with those uh, with those contaminants. In some cases you're able to actually sell the gas uh, to a local pipeline if you're in an, in an existing oil field or a gas field. So, but I do think that it avoids this issue of going to extremely high temperatures in geothermal production, which uh, can be, as you know, extremely challenging. So, so you can deal with fluids that are in the 100 to 200 Celsius range and actually enhance the heat content of those fluids through uh, co-production. So it has pluses, but it does have some challenges as well. Great. Yeah, that's good. Good answer. Thanks so, Tom, this one is... Can I jump in real quick? Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, McCool is exactly right. In fact, we're looking at, um, obviously, some uh, production where there would be co-production. Um, and he's exactly right. I mean, we have to be cognizant of the emissions. That's exactly what geothermal intends to eliminate. Um, he's exactly right in where you can use the uh, methane to reheat the working fluid right before it goes into the turbine and get more efficiency. Um, in our systems, we're using actually CO2 as our working fluid. So we see, our, I have a vision where, you know, if we do burn hydrocarbons, we would capture the uh, CO2 and then use that CO2 in our system. And so we think it could be a very carbon neutral or even a carbon negative process. So it's a it's definitely a challenge and not uh, something that we can solve overnight. But uh, long term vision could be that it's 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 carbon neutral or actually carbon negative. That's great. Anybody like to jump in before we go to the next question? Okay, so there are two questions that I think are perfect for John. But I think I know that he that there's one that's absolutely perfect. Okay, so I'll just combine the two. Are there existing pilot commercial operations in said heat around the world? And how big is this resource globally in terms of potential um, megawatts, gigawatts, terawatts produce, produced? Can you estimate? Sure. Um, yeah, and of course, there are existing geothermal systems here in the United States. Uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the more better ones, the Black Desert operation, uh, as an experimental plant that was run in Utah. The uh, a lot of the basins in the West are these deep rift basins with big thick sedimentary piles and high heat flow. So it's you can imagine most people are trying to pick the plums first. So uh, uh, so playing a little bit out in there. So those do exist. Uh, there are some things like the Delta plant that I think it's about 20 megawatts or something that are mixed, kind of mixed fractures, sedimentary plays that are uh, that are going on or out there. So they do exist. Um, I think that it's what's really what uh, what is kind of important at this point is much of the focus has been on what we call hot dry rocks, which of course are going for basement rock where most of the heat actually is. So there's huge, multiple times more heat down there in the basement rock, but as, uh, but as uh, McCool pointed out, it, you don't have the porosity. So it's all about fractures and fracking, but again, breakthrough, thermal breakthrough is why that we're not doing that right now. So this issue of fracturing, you got to connect the fractures in order to get a no permeability system to actually function as a flow unit, which means that by definition, you've connected fractures and you've created the potential for breakthrough. So dispersing in sedimentary basins is, is a better idea, but again, it's not a highly exploited idea. So I've given you a couple examples, but there's a lot more room. Again, it's, it's one of those things where that most of the attention has gone for the high enthalpy systems. And let's face it, we get used to doing what works. So why not burn a lump of coal? 
Uh, it's cheap, it's easy, it works, and, and, and geothermal is complicated. But the total, of, I think what has happened over the years is that the price point to actually produce these low enthalpy systems is getting, getting to us. So in terms of total resource, as I said, we're looking at 100, we're looking at about 100,000 exajoules uh, just here in the US. The earth total will actually radiate something on the order of 44 terawatts of heat from geothermal heat. So just for perspective, the whole US grid capacity is about one terawatt. So yeah, we got a lot of it. That's not the problem. It's a question of the setting up economic and efficient systems to harvest what's really a very highly dispersed but extremely abundant resource. And so I think what we're looking at right now and the big fundamental question that all of us are here trying to answer is, have we hit that threshold? where I remember the day when we were sitting around tables talking about how dumb an idea it was to try to extract oil and gas directly out of the source rock. And then I watched Mitchell and, and a few little technologists coming. And then in a matter of a, a year or two, suddenly that's all we were doing. And the question is, is where is that point in geothermal? Because once we cross that and somebody makes it a little more economically successful, everybody's going to copy it. But one thing I'd close on that that I'd say is really nice and one uh, sort of going back to prior question, one thing I like about it, geothermal is scales in lots of ways. There's room for big basin players like Chevron that are looking for very large plays and they're going after the elephants. But there's local wells, local basins just for mom and pop oil industry that's working a municipal, municipal power and heat source. That's really encouraging. Hey, hey, Susan, can I uh, add? Yeah, absolutely. So my, my oil field background's coming out again, but uh, another area that we have found to be quite interesting is the, uh, the Texas and Louisiana Gulf Coast. So there's been, um, as probably all you guys know, DOE studies that have gone back uh, many, many years. There's a lot of data out there. And, and of course, there's a lot of oil and gas wells drilled in these areas. So a lot of geologic data, but um, we're, we're looking at it for kind of a mid, lo, low to mid enthalpy hydrothermal type system. Um, but we're also looking at a lot of the, the these wells will produce a, a lower uh, uh, a water that you can easily desalinate. And, and the thing is, there's a lot of parts of the country that need water. We're, we're working with um, uh, South Texas, uh, one of the cities in South Texas that need wa fresh water. And so having that water production from those geopressured uh, zones and the fact that the total d dissolved solids in those zones are quite low, it, it's, it's, a, it's also a, a potential for not only generating electricity, but eventually uh, desaling the water and, and having that benefit to the community. That's wonderful. That's just really amazing. Yeah, Susan, can I also jump in with another sure, example? Absolutely. So this is an ongoing project. They're not producing electricity yet, but I think this is a very good example of, of low hanging fruit. This is in uh, Southern British Columbia. So it's an old gas field that's played out, but they, they knew that they had high temperatures. They've also knew that they had a high water drive within this. And so the First Nations tribe that owns the land is going to drill some geothermal wells in there to produce electricity because they're in Eastern British Columbia. So they're very far from where most of the electricity in the province is produced. So, you know, it's a, a nice example of, you know, you know, the, the water's there, you know, the flow rates are there, you know, the heat's there and it and it's, has a readily available market. Well, that's, that's a really good point. And then they don't have to actually do anything like create um, dams or anything like that for hydroelectric. Mikul, would you like, was there anything that you wanted to add to that? Well, I think um, uh, the, the challenge of course in all of this, as, uh, as John mentioned, is, is, to, um, is to produce this economically and be able to do it in a way in places where the power is really needed. If you're competing with power that's at you know, three to five cents a kilowatt hour, you're going to be in, in trouble. But if you're competing with power that's at, you know, 10 to 20 kilo, uh, cents a kilowatt hour, then 
then I think you're, uh, you're much more likely to be able to compete with that. So I think finding the right, the right location, not just geologically, but also from a power standpoint is, is in, in my mind, the, the, the critical thing. Sometimes that combination can be hard to find. And particularly if you limit yourself to very hot, very deep uh, areas, then, then that can be a challenge. One of the advantages of sedimentary rocks, I think, is that they're much more, uh, uh, much, there's many more of them around the US than, than some of these very deep, very hot things. So, so, so uh, you give yourself a lot more choice when you, when you, when you uh, lower your, your temperature on, on a requirement. So I think that's one of the advantages. And you make a good point about being close to infrastructure, et cetera. Okay, so here's a, a general question. Are there places in the world where hot sedimentary rock is not present? Is this resource geographically limited? Well, the answer to that depends on what you mean by hot, I suppose. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm sure there's places where you have to go very deep. Uh, to get some hot sedimentary rock, but but there are enough places uh, in the U.S. and around the world where you do find hot sedimentary rock. That and by, by hot I mean again much lower than what what Jeff might define it as, uh, but but around 150 C or something. It's it's actually possible to find those in, in many many places in the U.S. So so there's some studies, uh, Susan, that estimate sedimentary rock or like 98 percent of the geothermal resources. Whereas, uh, you know, the, the traditional um, hard rock that the hydrothermal is in now is like 2%, so very geologically limited. So it, it, from what I've seen, I'm not a geologist, don't claim to be, but I, it, it sounds like the, the sedimentary rock, even though it's maybe not everywhere in the world, it is much more prevalent. And, and as uh, McCool said, it's a matter of, can you get the temperature that you need uh, in that sedimentary rock? Yeah, I, I would add to that. Yeah, that broadly there are better areas and to to look. So just like the Western U.S. in general is has higher temperature gradients than the Eastern U.S. does. Um, some other countries. So um, you know, the former Soviet Union, as an example, is generally has low geothermal gradients. So that probably wouldn't be a good place to go. But again, it depends on you know what sort of temperature range. Interested. Yeah, and then on smaller scales, just looking at at Texas. So you know, South Texas is probably a good area. You know, the Permian probably less so. Yeah, and I will jump in on that uh, just a little bit as the resident sedimentologist. Is is that it, not everybody has a sedimentary basin, but almost everybody has a sedimentary basin. There's places like Sweden where they're going to have to run off to the run off to the shelf someplace and trying to find a little bit. But most of the world, they have sedimentary basins. We're very blessed with that. And most of us have deep sedimentary basins. So there's two things to consider on that. One is what Jeff was pointing out is a resource issue. The best place in terms of population, deep basin and high heat flow, go to South Texas. Uh, that's that right there is is kind of the the pickup line because uh, you know again there's places with differential heat flow heat flow ranges for 15 degrees a kilometer to 65 degrees a kilometer or two. Oh my gosh I stepped in lava but uh, but the thing is is that that is a highly variable thing the other thing though that is very encouraging that was when we started getting into this I remember it's heat and water are the two resources you're trying to play with here produce more water with low heat, you get the same kilowatts as higher heat and less water. So it's a balancing act, right? So generally the overriding ideas were something on the order of like about a half a barrel a second pump rates are kind of the things you're thinking about when you're economical, but in the tenths of a barrel a second, that, that sounds like a lot. But, and I remember when we first started, all the engineers and all the economists and all the bunch and even a lot of the sedimentologists were like, oh gosh, that just sounds unrealistic. And so I brought, and I thought about that and I brought one, I brought the, uh, the guy, Chad, who was writing the uh, NARAL economics report for sedimentary geothermal. And I brought him here and I introduced him to Steve Drake, who's doing wastewater injection in the Permian Basin. And he pointed out, oh my gosh, 
I pump that much water into the ground in wells as far as the eye can see. That's not my problem. Fresh water for fracks and energy is my problem down there. So the thing of it is, is that is a big obstacle to overcome and we seem to be able to overcome it in a lot of places in the world. The biggest thing I think that McCool is pointing out too is this co-production, but also the idea that you could use solar to heat the water before you put it into the ground. And that you can, you've got some tricks you can play and some games you can play to buck up the enthalpy such that even basins that don't actually have quite the heat you want, you might be able to generate use either by spiking the heat before you put it in, spiking the heat with thermal after thermal solar when it comes out, or co-producing petroleum products. You, you know, you've got other options to work on that temperature problem. I think one other thing we need to consider, it took solar and wind uh, several years to get offshore. So if we, if we consider offshore, um, I think the sedimentary basins around the world open up obviously a lot more. And, and, and oil and gas have already been drilling offshore for, for numerous decades. So uh, you know, that, that opens up the availability of sedimentary around the world. These are really great points and they sound really optimistic. So let's, let's change directions and let's talk about risk. And we have a few questions that, that deal with risk and, and issues of, of induced seismicity and, and other aspects of, of geothermal. And here's one question, can overpressured produced water disposal formations, such as Arbuckle in Oklahoma, be tapped and recycled for geothermal via new big bore wells, and could that reduce earthquake risk? I think um, I think uh, taking water out or injecting water into the Arbuckle is is tricky business, um, and um, I personally would stay away from it. But but it's it, it is something that we know it has caused problems before, and it's it's something that may cause problems in the future. And so there are obviously strict restrictions in certain parts of Oklahoma for injecting, for re-injecting the water as well. So, so I would say that th that would not be an ideal situation at all. Um, they're, they're much easier, much lower hanging fruit again than, than, than the injecting into the Arbuckle. So. John might want to say something on the geology of that and, and maybe uh, Jeff on the induced seismicity there. I'll, I'll, I'll just say a word too, but I think Jeff probably has some interesting things to say about this, uh, given his background. But, uh, but of course, uh, the obvious question is we do have some heavy porous units down there. The thing is, is that water is an incompressible fluid. And so you pump it into the ground, it's not like it's going to shrink. So uh, I guess people like Mark Zoback have been arguing for quite a while that the earth already exists at a critical shear strength straight and if it wasn't already at it, it's balancing its its natural shear stress whereby that uh, if it had any more it'd be generating earthquakes but if it, it doesn't have less because it would have spent them in earthquakes so uh, we're playing with a margin and we learned from wastewater injection the margin isn't as big as we had hoped uh, you, but I think the key thing about geothermal to keep, and we have had earthquakes generated by geothermal. I've, I have a talk online, I point out the Basel earthquake, it, you know, the Basel earthquake in Switzerland pretty much shut down geothermal exploration in Europe for several years. And so it is a thing that is a, is a concern. But I think the key thing to keep in mind with geothermal, that is different than wastewater injection. You're not just pumping water in, you're pulling it out. So you have a lot more potential to keep that pressure gradient balanced. Plus the other thing is, is that if you're dealing with the high enough temperatures or you can spike the heat to do flash steam, you're actually creating a steam chamber and you're pumping that steam through. It's gotta go through a condenser. You can't release the steam in the atmosphere, but if you can go send it through the condenser properly, as Cindy pointed out, you're making fresh water. And so that is a that is a product that you can actually use, sell, or uh, you know you aren't you have the potential theoretically to lower the pressure in the if, where it's already overpressured. But I'm with Bakul. There's a lot of places where I probably would not want to test that first. Right, and, yeah. and oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say you know induced seismicity is is definitely a risk. 
the geothermal. Again, I think that's one of the advantages of trying to do it in sedimentary basins and in terms of you already have some idea of what seismicity in that area is and whether um, prior oil and gas activity has, has induced seismicity. So Oklahoma being a, a good example of that. Um, that said, however, uh, you know, Oklahoma is a very interesting mature case now in terms of induced seismicity. In 2015, it was having, you know, it had more earthquakes than California each month. Uh, mm -hmm. Now it has almost no felt earthquakes. They're still injecting a lot of fluid into the Arbuckle, uh, just less than they were in 2015. And I think that's one of the, the key learnings from Oklahoma, as well as Rangeley and several other areas, is there seems to be some sort of critical pressure or stress relationship. And if you stay below that, you're okay. And if you go above it, then you start having earthquakes and potentially damaging earthquakes. But I mean, that's, that's a significant risk for geothermal, because even though you may not be changing the fluid pressure very much, you are changing the temperature. And so there are thermal stresses associated with it. And there's, in addition to Basel, there was a very large earthquake in South Korea a couple of years ago for geothermal that just shut the whole thing down. You know, so tens of millions of dollars lost. So it's a, it's a significant risk. Hey, Susan, I'd like to add that um, induced seismic seismicity obviously is a risk. And as Jeff said, it is less of a risk in, uh, in uh, sedimentary rock. Because I think the majority of the geothermal um, seismic induced seismicity has been an igneous rock. I, I could be wrong, but that's my understanding. The other thing we need to look at is the similar risk that you have in just oil and gas. I mean, you know, you're drilling a well, you have well control, um, you know, and, and, and other issues. Uh, uh, but, but the good thing is in sedimentary rock, again, there's significant knowledge and there's significant learnings that can already be leveraged from wells that have been drilled in the area. But I, I think with the softer rock, the, the, the size, induced seismicity chance is lower. And I think most of the, um, induced seismicity in uh, geothermal to date has been an igneous. Yes, yeah, that's, that's true. So kind of segue a bit, um, can the presenters comment on flow rates? The floor for marginally commercial geothermal well is about 30,000 barrels per day, according to the questioner, which is very high for an oil well. Do you think it's reasonable to get these flow rates predictably from most sedimentary basins? I'll take that, Susan. Uh, in our, you know, when I worked for Shell and in, in our deep water um, assets, that was not unusual to get 20 or 30 barrels uh, a day of production. So, um, you know, the oil and gas industry typically wouldn't test water zones because that's not what uh, the oil and gas industry was after. But it's a good challenge. But we have proven in uh, in existing wells that we can produce that kind of rate and find that kind of rate in the rock. And so I, I, we, we just have a belief that um, we can find those same types of water rates in, in the rock as well. Now, now, there's been a lot of experience in water injection and water production in the oil and gas business onshore as well as offshore. And um, those rates are achievable onshore and have been achieved onshore, particularly in injection wells. So um, obviously nobody wants to produce 30,000 barrels a day of, of water in the oil and gas business, but but certainly we've had quite a bit of experience injecting large volumes of water for disposal. Yes. So, okay, this next question could be really involved. So let's just think about how to keep it like as, as kind of streamlined as possible and per, perhaps a workflow. Can we get a review of how an oil and gas well can be repurposed for geothermal? Cindy mentioned it generally, but what are the details of how this is done? In other words, downhole heat exchangers, are these closed loops? Thoughts? I'll take off on the lead because I'm probably the least experienced with well filled. <laughs> and so that'll give everybody else something to fill in. But, uh, uh, but like as Cindy pointed out, most of the well oil wells, especially onshore, were not drilled to produce 
30, 40,000 barrels of water a day. And so this, so a lot of them are more, well more limited. So I think a lot of it has to do with what you actually want to achieve. If you're trying to do small scale space heating, simple, you know, you, you want to get a Rankin cycle uh, turbine brought to your well and generate about generate about nine, eight, nine cents a kilowatt hour power for local use, you probably don't have to do nearly as much as if you're wanting to try to set up a large system, in which case you might have to redrill the bore or, you know, or drill a parallel well or something because the well bores just weren't made that large. So I think a lot of that has to do with what your expectations, because surely there's plenty of wells that are, have the sufficient temperatures and can pr produce the, the significant water. There's apparently there's something on the order of the 10 ish thousand range just in Texas that had the SMU identified that fit that bill. But again, those are gonna be, if you wanna leave them as they are, you're talking small operations. Uh, if that's cool, you're good. If you want something like Jeff's looking for, you're probably drilling a larger bore. Yeah, Susan, we had a recent experience in our uh, test well in Stoner County. It was actually, um, uh, again, an explore, exploration well that was drilled, but uh, it was a dry hole for hyd hydrocarbons, so it was abandoned. So we, we basically uh, had to excavate the casing and reinstall our wellhead system. And, and the next steps that we're going to be working on is to re-enter the well, drill out the plugs, um, and then make sure that we, you know, drill out the plugs and actually we're going to clad a few uh, areas in the casing where there were some squeeze perfs. And so the, that's really just reestablishing the integrity of the well. Um, and, and so that's really the first step is to, to reestablish the integrity of the well if you need to, and then to set that well up for whatever purpose you want for it. And, and as John said, it could be for an injector or it could be for a actual producer. And, and from there, you know, it, it, you will have to determine whether the well bore size is big enough. And uh, if, if you, you are, you're actually deep enough as well to reach the temperatures that you're uh, targeting. But um, it's probably no different than just a recompletion or a you know, repurposing of a, of a well for oil and gas purposes, but there, there's well integrity, and then there's you know figuring out how to uh, uh, configure the well for the geothermal uh, production and/or injection. That makes sense. So here's a kind of a segue. In countries with considerable hydrocarbon production, such as Canada and the U.S., geothermal has difficulty competing with the low energy costs. If economic there will be a thundering herd developing this energy. What do we need to do to get this off the ground? Government support? My, my thought, Susan, we need to be cost competitive. We need to, when I was in unconventionals, my team would literally, they turned drilling from an art into a science. We, we optimize every foot that we drilled. We need to do that in geothermal. We need to optimize every foot that we drill. We need to optimize every molecule that comes out of the well that's carrying heat. And we need to optimize how we get the heat out of the earth and then how we get the, the heat out of the fluid that's carrying um, you know, the heat from the earth. And so if we can do that, and, and, and I, I think other people have said, we don't have, have the answers, <clears throat> excuse me, right now maybe, but if we work in the way that the unconventional shale plays worked over the years, we can drive those costs down. I mean, I, I think in five years, unconventionals drove the cost of the well to mm -hmm. down by 50%. And that was while the scope increased. So lateral length increased and the number of fracks increased, but the cost went down by 50%. If we can do that, we can make um, the lower temperatures, you know, in, in sedimentary rock, uh, geothermal, cost effective, and it can compete with wind and solar. That's my view. If you don't make it cost effective, it's not going to play. And I would, I would add to that, uh, of course, uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned in the past, is, is your interest in geothermal may be strictly profit driven. And it may be you know, environmentally CO2 driven, but I, get, I would argue they're one and the same because we're not the ones that are producing the largest amount of CO2 in the atmosphere on the electric grid. 
it's you know it's 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 places like China and India as they're developing and they're using the cheaper forms of energy and coal and so forth. So we've got to come up with solutions. Got to get this to where it's economically good enough to where it's at least competitive. If you're going to put a dent in this problem globally, it's going to be because you get this down into the range of where instead of the present you know nine eight nine cents a kilowatt hour that we're really looking at. We need to get it down to about three or four cents a kilowatt hour, uh, because essentially that is where you're talking when you're starting to compete with things like coal. And if you want to, if you want to really get, and it's also important to realize, I think, in that question, that we have to always separate the mobile energy from the fixed energy. So, with much of geothermal, what we're talking about right now is energy on the grid. We're talking about generating electricity and we're or we're talking about direct heat where you're replacing electricity, but we're not sticking geothermal in a jet engine and sending it flying. Petroleum is the only thing we've got that does that. And so petroleum and, of course, natural gas is the one that can serve both purposes in generating electricity economically and actually as a transportation fuel. But realistically, when we're talking geothermal right now, we're talking about the energy grid, not the transportation energy part of the system. And so our potential to really impact the grid is pretty high, though. Well, that, that kind of leads to a thought of the fact that the capital costs can be pretty high for geothermal and we need to have solutions, as people pointed out, of all sizes and they need to be scalable. Um, but then some of the, the people in the audience have pointed out the issue of energy depletion. So can someone speak to that? Like how long is a reservoir going to last? <laughs> Very quiet. <laughs> well, I mean, I, th I think, um, let me first address the, the earlier question and then address this, the, the more recent one. I, I, I think that um, geothermal is at a point where unconventionals were 20 years ago. And uh, I, I really think that we have to try different things. I think we have, as, as Cindy was saying, we have to bring the cost down systematically. And we have to try some new and different things with geothermal. Uh, and sedimentary is, is, is one of them. But then using sedimentary rocks in different ways is an experiment in progress. I mean, we haven't done this uh, in, in the past very much. So we have to explore what kinds of options and what kinds of combinations of things will actually be the most economical and the most widely applicable. It may not be that you have to go to 300 C. It may be that you have to use something lower temperature, maybe uh, something that actually produces larger volumes of fluid. So I think there's a lot of experimentation that's going to happen over the next five years. And I do think that geothermal ultimately will become competitive with some of the other sources of energy that we have. Uh, to the second um, uh, question, I, I think it's, a, it's, 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 it's really important that we, um, that we not try to um, uh, limit ourselves to uh, just the, the kind of um, uh, technologies that we, that we have done before and, uh, and, and, and see if we can apply some some fairly new ideas to, uh, to, uh, to, to geothermal. Um, I, I honestly believe that, that uh, in, in five years, we'll be, in, we'll be talking about uh, some new things that, that are going to come online that are going to allow us to get away from some of the limitations we had in the past. And uh, uh, looking at convection as well as conduction, um, if, you, if you start thinking about how long does it take for a reservoir to deplete, you have to talk about how fast it depletes one of the things that I think people find quite surprising is there's a lot of heat being com coming in from, from the earth, but the rate at which the heat comes in from the earth is actually quite small relative to the amount of heat that you extract. So it's renewable, yes, but it's renewable over you know, a long period of time, much longer than you're willing to wait um, through conduction. Um, and these are, these are not difficult calculations to make. Um, if, you, if you actually extract the heat fairly quickly, um, you have to find a way in which the heat has to be brought to you by mechanisms other than conduction, because otherwise you're gonna deplete the reservoir fairly quickly. And, and again, this is not a difficult calculation to make. You can do this on an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, and Susan, one data point, and I realize it's just one data point, was if you read about the Pleasant Bayou well in Bras Brazoria County, 
they produce that well for about a year and a half with no appreciable uh, decline in the uh, in the reservoir. So, and again, that's you know one reservoir, one well. But um, I think, as McCool said, we have to be cognizant of it. But there's a lot of reservoirs out there that have shown that they do not deplete very much over time. If you have convection. Yeah. Yeah. And I would uh, yeah. throw a, a couple points in there. One is, you know, I've heard, I've, I've seen fields and calculations where they're looking at about 30 year lifetimes in some of these, but you know, again, it is the thing of it's the other extreme of that is the thermal breakthrough problem, right? Where you basically create a crack, you mine the heat from the crack and now you just circulate in cold water. So those are, there are two end perspectives on there, but I think, one of the things I would I just want to plug here is the group at University of Utah who have been working on this idea of, in, of instead of just depending on harvesting the existing heat, adding heat to the water as you're pumping in and using it as an earth battery system, where basically you're using solar thermal energy to replace the heat you're extracting. And essentially what you're doing is you're making solar baseload by taking heat and putting it in the ground when you have it when the sun is up and then extracting it more smoothly through the geothermal system at the times you need it. And in those cases, you know, you're, you are extracting heat, but you're also talking about being able to replace the heat and those kinds of systems going forward. I mean, the bottom line is there's plenty of sunshine. We wouldn't be having this conversation if solar energy wasn't so intermittent because it is intermittent. You get it when the sun shines and you don't have it in the prime, uh, prime usage hours in the evening when you really want it. And so you have to constantly be trying to mess around and replace it. There's plenty of solar though. So if we can figure out, bat figure out battery sources to actually store the, store the solar so that it comes when we want it rather than when it decides to come, then well, we're going to be using solar on the grid. There's, we've got it. It's free. There's a lot of it. It, it does cost a lot to install the photo, uh, photovoltaics, but the bottom line of it is, is that, that fuel's coming for free too, just like geothermal. But I think the real thing is one pioneering area that we have is to look, at, look closer at this earth battery idea and use, look at using the earth as a way to store this energy in small amounts and to spike the heat just enough to make the geothermal stable and economical without overdoing it, as Jeff pointed out. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I was going to ask you. So Jeff, um, is Chevron working on any projects that are at the point of, of being operational? No, not not currently. We we are partnering with several um, geothermal companies uh, to so we are working with uh, Avor and and several other companies. Um, but we're in, internally. So we were we were fairly we were big in conventional geothermal uh, a number of years ago. But we sold those. I mean, they were very profitable, but we got a good price for them. So we sold them off uh, uh, in Indonesia and to the Philippines. And now we're sort of, you know, re entering the area uh, and, you know, looking across a broad spectrum, you know, from EGS to, you know, do we want to use co produced um, fluids to, you know, heat one of our platforms? Um, but we don't we don't have any project that's close to being operational right now. Thank you. That, that, that's that's interesting. So we'll, going back to risk a bit, what about the potential for land subsidence in geothermal projects in sedimentary basins? How could it be avoided if it's applicable? I think you, uh, the, the risk of subsidence actually sh would be quite a bit lower in geothermal than it would be in hydrocarbon production, primarily because, as was mentioned earlier, you are injecting and producing fluids. You're not right. just draining the reservoir and reducing the pore pressure. So I think the and, and you're you're uh, you're uh, injecting and producing fluids from naturally fractured rocks, typically, and these are fairly competent rocks. Um, so you're not uh, going into a, a pile of sand and, and emptying out the fluids. Uh, so I think the risk of subsidence is, is actually a lot less for geothermal than it would be for, uh, for uh, conventional hydrocarbon production. 
I will say that this idea that John mentioned about solar and, and uh, using the ground as, as a battery, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that, to be honest. I've, we've done some calculations and I think it's, uh, it's actually much better to use solar on, 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 on the fluid coming out rather than the fluid going in. Because uh, if you try to heat up the earth and store energy there, you, you could, that's, a, that's a losing battle, I think. It's, uh, it's very, very difficult to provide enough heat to, uh, to actually store things in, in, in the ground. So I think you'd much rather do the solar on, on the way out, the fluid coming out rather than the fluid going in. Yeah, and, and I would, uh, I, I'll go ahead and uh, play antagonist on this one just a little bit. Sure, but, sure. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, there are plants that are doing that. Still water in Nevada is doing this and, and it, it does work and it's, and it's attractive because it's simple. But the problem, of course, you're back where you were before, where that you can only really heat the water when you're actually getting the thermal solar. So you're so the problem they're running into in uh, California and some of these areas, the duck curve, where that over the course of the day they've put in so much solar uh, energy that they're having to power down the other plants to keep the energy grid stable, and then suddenly they're dealing with like a well, I think they're up to about a 13 gigawatt ramp up in about three hours in the evening because the peak usage is in the evening after dark when the, when the sun has gone down. So it, what, so what McCool says is, is works and it's being done and it's, it's a great thing. I would say though, uh, it's, this is a pioneering thing. Obviously, this is one of those areas where nobody's tried earth battery for real. I mean, we've done it on the local level. For instance, I think I, I, have, a sl I have a slide where the, there was like something like 23,000 home scale geothermal earth battery storage units at the household level were approved in the Netherlands last year. Uh, so it's being done. But that said, the big scale earth battery, giga, mega, 100 megawatt type thing, Nobody I know of is actually doing that yet. What I would say though about my about the people I work with with the University of Utah, they've run numbers too. And they've run simulations and they think that with with the right configurations, they can get back about 95% of the heat they put in the ground after about a hundred cycles. So about a hundred days of pumping and circulating, they, they, their simulations are showing something on the order of about 95% return. But I think the key thing is you're already working in a basin where you're at base charge. You're right at that place where you would probably be able to do geothermal economically anyway, it'd just be a little marginal. But yeah, so you're not having to heat the earth up a lot in order to do this. So if you're not overdoing it and you start out with a good warm reservoir to begin with, yeah, they're thinking you can get about all of it back. So I've got a question for Cindy. It's our last question, people can chime in. And thank you, John. Um, so regards to co-production, what is the probability of contamination in sedimentary basins? And I would also add to that probability of say, Dissolution, if we're in in carbonates, et cetera, that could lead to some collapse, dolines, et cetera. Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't think it's any different from what oil and gas deals with now. Um, we're, we would be using that fluid to heat a secondary fluid in a downhole heat exchanger. So I think we would handle that fluid in the same way as the oil and gas uh, industry handles it now. It, and so contamination. Um, I, it, you have to be cognizant of that in the oil and gas industry already. Um, you have to be uh, worried about it for your material selection, you know, depending on what you're producing. But I, I, Susan, I don't think it would be any, any different for geothermal. Okay. Mine just have to be a little bit more um, selective into types of sensors and monitoring, et cetera, in terms of fluid loss, maybe. But... Um, so any other thoughts so like, here's a kind of final comment from one of the audience members. In the 1980s, there was significant work on Gulf Coast geopressured systems. Why did that stop if it's such a great resource? What happened? Yes, yeah, Susan, I, I, I'll answer that. Um, it, it was in the 19, well, 1989, 1990, this Pleasant Bayou well that I was speaking about um, they were able to generate um, 
a half a megawatt from geothermal power only. They, they, they generated 1.5 megawatts, but that was geothermal, that was methane, and that was pressure. Um, but at the time, oil and gas prices, especially gas prices, were so incredibly low, they just couldn't compete. And, you know, let, let's be honest with you, there was not the um, interest in, in pivoting to renewables back in 1989, 1990. So it, it couldn't compete economically. There was not a, a, a society interest in, in going to geothermal. And so that was the reflection on why it was shut down. Great. So we're at the five minute warning. So, Mikula, in your final, I'll invite you to take the, be the first person to do your one minute closing statement and you can incorporate your comments with that. Okay. I was just going to say the Pleasant Bayou well, the, 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 a lot of that work was done at, uh, at, uh, in Louisiana and, and UT uh, back then. And I was involved in a small portion of it. But the economics and the social environment was so different back then, as, as Cindy said that um, uh, you know, what makes a whole lot of sense now didn't really make much sense back then commercially. Um, but the, the, the interesting thing is that it was proved out technically that you could actually do geothermal in sedimentary rocks and, uh, and, and do it uh, over a long period of time if, if you wanted to. So, so this is something that I think would, uh, uh, is something we can pursue in the future. Geopressure, geothermal is, is something that I think is uh, something that can be pursued in, in today's environment for sure. Um, I'll just say one other thing, and that is, you know, uh, if, if you do uh, the conventional way of doing things, EGS particularly, um, the capital costs are very high, as you said, Susan. Um, sedimentary rocks, particularly geopressured formations, provide a way of reducing that capital by an order of magnitude. And that really is the attractive thing about, about doing it that way. Um, there are also some very interesting technologies that are going to come in, that are going to actually be um, um, alternatives to turbines and Rankine cycles and so on. And I think that's, the, that's one of the things that I'm most excited about is, is how we can actually do, when you have moving parts in turbines and, and brines, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to manage. Um, if you can do, uh, uh, if you can generate electricity uh, without that, those options, then I think you, you're, you're moving forward in a, very, in a very different direction. And I think in, in, in the right direction to make it much more economical and much more robust. So I'll, I'll just stop there. Okay, you have to because we're at a two minute morning. <laughs> so each person has a few uh, seconds for a wrap up. So John, would you like to go and then Jeff and then Cindy? Sure, I'll just do a quick wrap up uh, as quick as I can. Um, is, is that I remember I got into this sedimentary base in geothermal because as we looked at the stuff that was working the hot dry rocks, the reality of it is the sedimentary basin solves a lot of problems. It solves a lot of our thermal breakthrough problems. You already have the porosity, you already have the water, we already have the wells, we already have the expertise. And again, we went in the years that I have been working with this to where our thoughts were, maybe we can do this for dollars to surely we can do it for pennies. So in just the last few years, the economics have may, have changed dramatically because of increased technology and breakthroughs, and like I say, it's one of those things where they can where they envision us a few years ago talking about conventionals and how absurd it sounded and how normal it sounds today. So, uh, do you want? So somebody needs to be the pioneer and step up and just say, "I'm going to take the chance and make the investment," and. Uh, and I get and and you know go down in history. Wonderful, thank you, John. That's great, Jeff. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Um, uh, we just need our George Mitchell and our Barnett Shale uh, for geothermal, and then I think the whole thing will take off. I agree. That's wonderful. Very succinct and and wise. <laughs> so, uh, Cindy, you have the last word. Yeah, Susan, thanks uh, so much for moderating this panel. I guess I just want to leave everybody with a picture. If we can get three megawatts per well in a sedimentary basin with a low to mid enthalpy well, so 100 to 250 C, we could deliver with 20,000 wells, 60 gigawatts per year. And delivering 20,000 wells per year for the oil and gas industry is not a stretch. We're doing it now. And so we could literally, if we can crack this nut, we can be delivering 60 gigawatts per year with geothermal. Wonderful. Well, I'm Susan Nash, AAPG. I'd like to thank Jamie and Pivot 2021 and all the sponsors. 
for the, this opportunity. We've had wonderful insights from our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.